So today I chose the subject of silence, and uh, I'm not sure if this is a, an attractive subject or not. I think it might sort of bring up a little bit of, can I do it, can I not do it? Is silence something that's really attainable for me? And at the same time, I think we're very drawn to silence, you know, especially in this world of ours, which is fairly busy and noisy, and you know, there's a kind of onslaught, really, of the senses. You're bombarded with all kinds of mechanical noise, the traffic, you know, the tubes, which are apparently 100 decibels. And uh, the World Health Organization actually said that uh, next to air pollution, noise pollution is one of the most substantial health risks to us. You know, it's one of the most pollutive qualities because we need silence, you know. And of course, as spiritual practitioners, we probably understand that most insight is had, is had in silence. You know, most... Uh, deep spiritual experiences happen in a silent mind, not in a busy, noisy mind. So the external noise is obviously one of the you know, things that can threaten silence in, in the outside world. And one of the definitions of uh, silence, which I just noted down, was the conditional quality of keeping still and silent, or the absence of sound. <coughs> so this is interesting from a Buddhist perspective, because uh, the Buddha does talk a lot about absences. He talks about what's missing, you know, endings, stillings, <coughs> classification, cessation. So this is all the same kind of spectrum of things ending. And I think it's really nice to notice that even when there is a lot of external noise, there's also an end to that noise, you know. When I'm speaking, there's a gap between one word and the next, or one sentence and the next. And yet we're kind of programmed often to look for what's there, and we forget to look for what's missing. So looking for what's missing is very close to emptiness. And um, there's a couple of suttas in the Buddhist uh, texts, in Majjhima Nikaya in particular, that talk about learning to perceive the absence. So there's a really lovely sutta called Chula Sunyata Sutta. And the Buddha says that um, one moves towards the forest for meditation and notices the absence of the village. So you're noticing that you know, when you're in a place like this, for example, you're no longer in the city, you're no longer at work, you're no longer at home with, you know, maybe family members talking to you or kids screaming or, you know, whatever demands and pressures there are on you, that is now missing. And sometimes we fail to notice that, you know, especially with our minds which are kind of primed to look at what's wrong quite often. We have this thing called the fault-finding mind that my teacher Arjun Brown likes to talk about a lot. And it's always looking at the thing to improve or the thing that's wrong with our experience. But the idea of emptiness and silence is to look at what is actually right, you know, what is actually there, or what, you know, what kind of disturbances and afflictions are missing. So it's a slightly different shift in perception. And um, in this sutta, it goes from, you know, moving from the village into the forest and then noticing the sounds in the forest. You know, like here, we notice the seagulls. It's a different kind of sound, perhaps a little bit more relaxing than the sound of an aeroplane or you know, the tube, which is really quite noisy. One of my most uh, treasured possessions is earplugs, because <laughs> I'm a really light sleeper. And um, I'm so jealous of my teacher, because he has these, like, personalised, custom-made earplugs where they pour <laughs> some kind of wax or, I don't know, silicon or something in your ear and then send it all the way to Sydney from Perth. And then you get these two little earplugs which fit right in and sort of click into place, <laughs> left and right earplugs. And uh, I used to think, why does he wear these? Surely he should be economist to noise, you know. But I think there's a difference between aversion to noise and an inclination and appreciation of silence. And I think, you know, with developing this inclination to silence, it's important to notice whether we're generating more aversion to noise or actually learning to find that silence within the noise. So there's different ways we can practice, you know, because it's very hard and silence is a quite a scarce and precious resource in the world. It takes quite a bit of effort to, you know, arrange life so that you can have moments of silence. You know, often people think, let's go to the beach on the seafront where you can have some silence. But if you actually sit there for a while, you'll notice that waves are fairly noisy. So there's this kind of, you know, crashing of the waves. It's not really as still as, say, the dark, deep caves that you find in countries like Burma or Thailand or even Australia. My teacher has a nice cave that's been custom made, which is all soundproof. <laughs> <laughs> it's like going into the room. You know? It's like being in the womb. It's amazing. I've sat in there a few times. And it's like the silence is a presence. You know? And that's another definition that I wanted to bring in because I think it's um, Thich Nhat Hanh who says uh, 
defines silence as the power of quiet in a world full of noise. So again, there's this reference to noise, but it's focusing on the beauty, the power, the richness, you know, the fulfillment, if you like, of, of something called silence, which is a pleasance. Sometimes you can really tangibly feel it or even hear it. I know that here there'll probably be people who've practiced with Ajahn Samedo's method, the sound of silence. And uh, sometimes the silence can become quite deafening. I had one retreat in uh, Gujarat many years ago. It was a 45-day silent retreat, and we have absolute sense restraint. I mean, there's, you know, you don't even look up. <coughs> I mean, there was one retreat I did once, and I put my laundry in at the beginning of the retreat. But I wasn't looking up, so I just knew the way, very important way, from the dining to the meditation hall and back. That's all you'd really need, right? The silence and then the food <laughs> <laughs> to sustain you. And, uh, and I didn't look up. And so at the end of the retreat, I was thinking, well, you know, I guess the laundry disappeared, but never mind, I'm going to do with what I've got. And then I noticed that some feet were walking in this direction. I thought, oh, I wonder what's over there. And then I saw the laundry table <laughs> with all the <laughs> tags. And it had been there the whole retreat, you know, but I hadn't noticed. So the sensory strength is very strong, and um, you literally don't see anybody. You just see their shoes, and at the end, you sort of match the face with the shoes, which is quite interesting, usually different from what you expect. And uh, during this retreat, there was just such an intense silence building up. It was really loud. It was sort of reverberating in my head, you know, almost leaving no space for anything else, but, but very compelling. But I, I guess from my perspective, it's perhaps sometimes important not to focus too much on those sounds because that is another perception. You know, we can even go beyond that and, and just hear the actual silence of the silence, if that makes sense. I don't know if that does make sense. But uh, <clears throat> another thing that Thich Nhat Hanh says, which I like, is that we need silence as much as we need air and as much as plants need light. And one of the things with it is that if our mind is full of thoughts and memories and, you know, the reverberations of speech, especially wrong speech, there's simply no space to hear ourselves, you know, to hear our deeper intuitions or, you know, really to connect with what's going on in our heart. It's very hard. We almost squeeze ourselves out of the picture, you know, with all the noise and the distractions that we bring in. And I think silence, you know, is very important in so many fields of life. I mean, one of the things it's so closely connected to is the ability to listen. And uh, I had a very nice experience last year. I spent a couple of months at Gaia House as the resident teacher. And as a resident teacher, you're not really there to teach. It's more that you're there in a holding capacity for retreatants who are on their own retreat. And, you know, everybody's practicing differently. So I saw my role as just offering a space, really, for them to bring forth whatever they felt was pertinent to them in their practice or in their life without interjecting too much. And during the first interview, I noticed that after sort of a couple of sentences, I was thinking, hmm, I could respond with this or respond with that, you know, various tools that I've learned through my practice. And I just let that one lie, you know, sort of sat back into the silence and uh, realized that, yeah, that wasn't really what was needed. And so the practice for me became a sense of listening with empathy and noticing kind of the space between me and the person who'd come and building that space as a very quiet and warm place. So it wasn't so much about the content even that was being put to me or, or my verbal responses, it was more about an exchange of energy and a space in which that could be held and met with kindness. And at that time I didn't have a lot of time to meditate, so these interview sessions were my main practice. And I found it so interesting to see that when I resisted that urge to come back with a response, there'd be a pause, there'd be a gap, be some silence between us and I'd focus on putting kindness in that gap you know in that space between myself and the other person and somewhere along the way a response would just come sometimes it was very simple response just as I hear you you know or that must be difficult other times it was something that seemed to just pop up that was usually quite relevant for that person and so you know getting that familiarity with the space between you know the words or the sentences is also can be very deepening and can give us the chance to really listen to ourselves and sometimes put ourselves aside so we're not responding from a place of ego but it allows for something an experience beyond words and concepts to arise you know and, and silence gives the space for that so it can be very beautiful and of course used in therapeutic settings um, something which um, increases our appreciation of art and music 
there's one composer I forget the name of, but he said that he had to learn to gently draw out the notes from the silence. That was how he learned to compose. So it's like as if they were there in the silence, but it was by listening to the silence itself that he heard the music. You know, rather than music being an overlay on the silence. And another really lovely um, definition of silence by Lao Tzu, the great uh, Chinese philosopher, is that uh, silence is the great revelation. So again, this sort of intonates at the spiritual power of silence. Um, the fact that silence can be a very powerful thing and also something that reveals something that perhaps is obscured by the words, by the noises, by the sounds. You know, especially by the sounds within our own head. Because it's one thing to sort of remove and distance ourselves from external noise and perhaps move towards the more pleasant noises of nature, you know, much softer, much more repetitive and calming to, you know, a total space of silence where we start to see our inner thoughts. You know, often we think that if we can get rid of the external distractions, we can enjoy silence. But there's a whole world within ourselves that that's often covering up. You know, we don't even see it. And because of this, silence can also be very scary. I think it's Carl Jung that said something like, that fear loves noise because it can't be heard. You know? Basically, you drown it out with the noise. And this is something that comes up in meditation throughout the practice, you know, especially as you go into deeper stages where perhaps you are going beyond the known, beyond the conceptual world, into something deeper, more intuitive, more emotional in a way, you know, especially with things like metta practice or samadhi practice. You know, there's a sort of, there's something that starts to take over. <coughs> Sometimes it can be described as peace or a kind of bliss, and it starts to take over the rational conceptual mind. And that can bring up fear because we're entering territories that we don't yet know. You know, and the way forward there is, is not through the head, but through the heart and through a sense of trust. So what's really helpful here is that we learn to trust the silence. You know, just to trust that it's perhaps revealing something to us that we don't yet know. You know silence is so much closer to truth than words and concepts. This is why very often people get their greatest uh, insights in silence. And that silence also gives a very fertile ground for those insights to take deeper root. Because whenever we're thinking, we're basically caught up in, in the hindrances. I mean, there are different kinds of thinking. Some are obviously much more fueled by greed and negativity or delusion than others. But generally speaking, I mean, the Buddha described the hindrances as um, obscurations of the mind which obscure wisdom. I think imperfections, he said, or obscurations. I like to think of them as curtains, you know, they're sort of closing ourselves to a deeper reality. And, uh, and they obscure wisdom because of that. So wisdom isn't something we think or we figure out, you know. Um, and I think this is difficult for us, especially brought up in Western cultures and trained in sort of thinking critically, analytical thought. I know for myself, I've often thought that if I can just think wisely about something, think around it in enough ways, I'll get to the answer. But often we're just getting ourselves entangled in more and more concepts and the answer is something that we haven't yet, you know, contacted. It's something very intuitive. So, uh, yeah, so these are the sort of, uh, sort of different perspectives on silence, but I also wanted to just uh, talk a little bit about the role of silence in the gradual training from the sutta's perspective. So I always think it's very beautiful to go back to the words of the Buddha and just see how many of these ideas and experiences are actually contained there, you know, in the Buddha's teachings. Um, and in a way, you could see the whole path as a movement towards silence, a movement towards stilling the mind, as I said before. And this tends to happen through the bodily stilling and, and quietening of our, ment of our bodily actions, you know, through sila, through cultivating wholesome qualities and cultivating, you know, ethics. And not only the abstinence of, of things which defile the mind, but the performance of beautiful things. You know. um, and then also the verbal um, stilling, so starting to calm down our speech and learn to use speech in a wise way. Because I think, you know, there can be a shadow side to silence in that sometimes we can use silence as, almost as a weapon or a kind of protection. I've seen this happen in retreats quite a lot, you know. People can become very sort of sensitive about their silence as if that starts to belong to them and we take hold and start to appropriate silence as something that you know, other people can disturb. 
And then silence becomes this very brittle kind of thing, which isn't it doesn't offer the spaciousness and the sense of safety that it should offer, you know, in which people can feel held with whatever they bring. It's it's something that, you know, is in danger of being disturbed. So it becomes quite narrow and confining. And um, somebody wrote to me recently to say that there was a retreat at Amravati quite many years ago, I think, called a conviviality retreat, where there wasn't a very um, clear parameter for keeping silence or speaking. It was, it was left up to the retreatants to find what worked for them. So some people could go into silence if they wanted. Other people maybe found it more helpful to practice a bit of right speech, to perhaps smile at each other or have a chat you know, some Dhamma discussion, if that might support them. But it was very, uh, I think it raised a lot of uh, conflict because some people did feel frustrated that they couldn't remain in a cocoon the way they wanted to, you know, and people were disturbing their silence. And uh, I've had my own experience of that in Burma where um, one particular nun was very intent on doing serious <coughs> practice and she'd say, I'm going to be in serious silence. <laughs> and the undertone was, of course, don't disturb me, you know. And if you're sick or whatever, which I was, don't come near me because I don't want to know. I'm in serious silence. And that was some kind of higher practice. <laughs> so um, around that time, actually, that was when I first got in contact with my teacher, Andrew Brown's teachings. And he talked so much about the place of silence and the place of talking, right speech, right intention. And just really focusing on, you know, little acts of kindness, which has become a bit of a catchphrase now, but the little things we can do for each other, even in silence, you know. You can make someone a cup of tea when they don't expect it. They can come back from their six-hour-long sit and there's a little cup of tea at the door, you know. These kind of things really warm and soften the heart, and I think that's the purpose of silence, that we soften around it, we soften into it, and we appreciate the silence that is there, even, you know, within the words or between the words or... Even in a noisy place, you know, there's a, a rising of sound and there's a passing away of sound, and it passes back into that silence. So I thought that was quite interesting. But um, in the gradual training, you'll find that uh, this is from the Buddhist text perspective that it is gradual and it starts often with just developing confidence in the teachings, and through the confidence, learning to simplify one's life. So you can see how, you know, when a lifestyle becomes more simple, there's less to worry about, there's less to be concerned about. You know, you might notice that people with the biggest houses or, you know, in the best, so-called best parts of town have the biggest gates, <laughs> you know, because there's more to protect, there's more to sort of feel belongs to you and also to start to rely on and depend on. And I think there's a real freeing aspect of owning very little. I mean, I only have this one robe, and people were saying, well, why don't you, don't you have a second one? Because it's completely falling apart. You've seen I've patched it many times, but it just keeps ripping. But, you know, there's something very nice about that, because you think, well, you know, if I have to go home in a raggy robe, so what? It doesn't really matter, you know. I can always find a patch. <laughs> Maybe a nice bright pink one or something. <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, and this simplicity means we have less to think about. So this was a prerequisite in the Buddhist teaching long before we started to go into solitude. So the simplifying is a, is a kind of um, quietening of the bodily and um, verbal and mental activity. <coughs> and then from there the Buddha would talk about the precepts. And I just wanted to read a little bit out about how he defines right speech because it's very beautiful and it, as I say, it doesn't only look at the, uh, you know, not speaking malicious, false, untrue speech, but the active qualities of speaking beautiful speech. So I just wanted to read this out because you can see how, obviously, by abstaining, a whole heap of suffering, a whole heap of affliction subsides, you know, affliction for oneself and affliction for others. But then we can start to incline our speech towards something which brings about very beautiful qualities in the world. <coughs> <coughs> so this is in the Kandaraka Sutta, which is uh, the 51st Sutta. So here it says, abandoning false speech. She abstains from false speech, speaks truth, adheres to truth, is trustworthy and reliable, one who is no deceiver of the world, so this is already, I find, very gladdening for the heart just to hear these words. Abandoning malicious speech, she abstains from malicious speech, <coughs> does not repeat elsewhere what she's heard here in order to divide those people from these. 
nor repeats to these people what she's heard elsewhere in order to divide these people from those. Thus is one who reunites those who are divided, a promoter of friendship, who enjoys concord, <coughs> rejoices in concord, delights in concord, and a speaker of words that promote concord. I think this would reduce probably 80% of our speech. <laughs> because so often when we speak, it's about trying to figure things out or fix things up, you know, or talk about how these people did that to me yesterday, or, you know, what do you do when this person behaves in this way? Which is great, you know, sometimes we need to try and problem solve, but if we actually speak words that promote concord, it's much, it takes a lot more thought and consideration and looking at things in different ways, so it starts to retrain our mind to incline towards the beautiful. <coughs> and then abandoning harsh speech, she abstains from harsh speech, speaks such words as are gentle, pleasing to the ear and lovable, as go to the heart, are courteous, desired by many, and agreeable to many. So I like this part about going to the heart, because I think in order to really benefit from a silent atmosphere, one has to feel, first of all, safe. And if you feel that you're in a place which is very kind and there are people around who care, it's so much easier then to say, OK, now I'm going back to my kuti, back to my heart, to practice, because you know you're in a, a very safe space. You know, If anything comes up for you in the practice, there are people who can hold that. It's very different from saying, right, I'm fed up with this conversation, let me have my silence. You know, you, you go with a little bit of a reverberation in the mind, you know, from a, an exchange that perhaps wasn't very pleasant. But here we're sort of pacifying any kind of conflict in community, first of all, and then taking our space later on. And then the last one is to abandon gossip. So abandoning gossip, she abstains from gossip, speaks at the right time, so this is also really important because sometimes it's not the right time. You know, one of the things that's not the right time is perhaps to admonish someone in public, for example, or to speak to them when they're tired or overwhelmed. You know, they're not in the mood to hear what you have to say or perhaps feedback about themselves. So we're very sensitive about the right time. I like to ask people, actually, especially if I do have something that's maybe difficult to raise, whether it is a good time for them. You know. And if they say, no, it isn't, then I think it's important to respect that. So they speak on fact and what is good, speaking on the Dhamma and the discipline, and at the right time speak, speak such words that are worth recording, reasonable, moderate, and beneficial. So learning the right speech, first of all, is important, you know, because silence can, as I say, be used as a weapon. And I think it was Martin Luther King. I just Googled, you know, quotes on silence, and it was interesting because all of his were actually the dark side of silence. It was, you know, he said something like, um, in the long run, we won't remember the words of our enemies, we'll remember the silence of our friends, you know. So sometimes silence can be used as a way not to speak up, not to fight justice, for justice. And uh, he said that you begin to die the day you stop speaking about things that matter. You know, so there is something like a practice. It's not just a kind of removal from the world. So I think that's really important. And, uh, and after the, the section on sila in the gradual training, the Buddha then talks about contentment, finding contentment with little. And in this uh, particular sutta, it is aimed at you know, monastic life. So it says, with, with the robes and the bowl as their only burden, they just fly through the air like a bird with their wings, the only burden, something like this. Um, and, and this applies to people in the world too. I mean, I've just been staying with Tess and Michael and the way you live, you know, it's very simple. You've made an active decision to be in a quiet place and to live with what's needed and to create an atmosphere where there's a lot of spaciousness, a lot of light and sort of an energy that's moving through, you know, it's not a stuffy feeling. So, you know, the Buddha often described the home life as crowded and dusty, you know, and the urge to go forth was to leave this crowded and dusty world. Even as a monastic, it can be crowded and dusty. People get, you know, very funny about their requisites. It's like, you've got a nicer quality of cotton on your robe, or <laughs> you've got a really nicely embroidered kind of arms bowl holder. <laughs> you know, so the mind is the mind, wherever you are, but the whole idea is to just start to develop contentment, because so much thinking comes from discontent. You know, if you're really content with life, you don't need to talk back at it. You know, life is enough. Like, you are enough, right, in this moment. This is enough. You know, the silence is enough. We don't have to constantly argue with it, you know. 
So the contentment comes next, and the Buddha says that with this, um, the happiness arises from the sila and from the contentment, and he calls this the aggregate of um, um, noble virtue. And he says from this you can experience a bliss that is blameless. So this is the kind of underlying happiness that's there in a life that's well lived. And again, something we often don't notice because we're looking for what's wrong. You know, and there, there is this underlying sense of moral integrity, of a lack of remorse. You know? I mean, a lot of thinking comes around because we, our behavior hasn't been up to scratch and we go back onto the cushion and mull over it and realize we've hurt somebody and we need to fix that up, you know, which entails more conversation. So, you know, when we practice, especially with right speech, there's much less to kind of sort out afterwards. There's much less mess. And so we have this kind of happiness that's a sort of freedom from knowing that we're living in the best way we can. And it's important to notice that happiness because the next stage on the um, path of gradual training is to start to work at the mental level. So not only the ethical conduct of um, speech and uh, bodily action, but also the way we use our mind. And this involves learning to perceive or attend to the objects of the senses which includes sentient beings who are not just objects but real people who hurt and perceive them in a way that leads to our wholesome qualities increasing yeah? so it's like I could take Francis or somebody who I know and I could look at your thoughts you know? I could look at you in a way that would make me feel irritated and that wouldn't be very good for my mental development basically and is that really true? is that really what you are or what anybody is? You know, there are aspects of people who may irritate us at times. At other times, we see that as a nice quirk or whatever it is, you know. But there's another side of a person I can look at too. It could be to see those very same perceived negativities in a positive light, or it could be just to focus on the beautiful parts of that person. And there are far more beautiful parts to any of us here. I mean, you know, your people who've spent your Sunday coming to a place where you're going to explore silence, you're going to you know, look at yourself, meet your own world and start taking responsibility for that, you know, in a way that brings happiness for you and, and you know, decreases the harm in, in the world. You know, we harm each other so much by careless ways of using our mind. And so that's really something very beautiful that we should take time to reflect on. And the Buddha said, you know, one of the ways of overcoming anger is kind of, it's like there's a, a pond and... Uh, when you see somebody's negativities, it's like you see all the moss that's covering the clear water. And he says that, you know, you don't have to take the moss out, but you can just remove it to the side, and then you can see the water, and you can even drink from that water. And there's another simile whereby a person is very sort of defiled, perhaps like a person who does a lot of harm with their body and mind, and you can't easily see uh, their qualities. And he said that's like a puddle of water, which is kind of dirty. And, you know, it's very difficult to drink from. But for that, you have to get on your hands and knees and just cop the water into your mouth. And that way you can take some kind of, um, you know, liquid to quench your thirst or whatever, or to quench the anger, to pacify the anger. So somehow or another, we have to get underneath, you know, our habitual ways of looking and move aside these curtains of delusion, these kind of aspects of negativity and try to learn to see people in a way, or to see life in a way that is good for ourselves, you know, and, and trains our mind to look at the beautiful and to understand how to cultivate positivity. And then the Buddha says, if we can do this, we, we get another kind of happiness, which is called the unsullied bliss. And I kind of wondered what that meant until um, my recent Rays retreat, where I was uh, in a situation where... Basically, I was inside a cottage uh, for two weeks and I hardly came out of there at all. And I was developing a lot of energy in my mind, you know, really, really quieting it down and noticing whenever my mind wanted to go off into thinking and just slowing it right back down and just maintaining this kind of level of quiet and noticing very carefully um, the effect of any actions. I mean, at that time, I was actually putting like a potato in the microwave because he said, that's okay, I'm not really cooking. I can just, you know, put it in the microwave so I don't have to go out, you know, so put it in there. But, um, you know, you could easily see how it's like, oh, okay, now I've got to do this. And then, okay, slow it down, you know, just slow it down and keep everything at this really quiet level. And uh, when I was doing that, my mind was getting very still and hardly any thinking was happening. And then I started to understand what the Buddha meant by saying that it's like, when you start thinking, it's like having a leak in the bucket, 
he actually calls it leaking mindfulness away. You know, the mindfulness is going out of the present moment and into thoughts. And that thoughts are very tiring for the mind. So I started to notice that even one or two thoughts were actually draining my energy and it would take a bit longer to recover that sort of very vibrant mind which was getting quite empowered in my retreat. And then I noticed that even going outside into the nature, although nature is really calming, at a certain point it was also more preferable to go back inside into my mind. There was more happiness to be gained away from the senses than there was even in beautiful sights, beautiful sounds, you know, the peaceful forests, the rustling leaves. It was actually nicer to be inside. And so I could see what the Buddha meant by an unsolid bliss, because it was almost as though even a nice taste would just be putting an overlay on, on the happiness of the mind. It was like something more agitating that would take me away from that very, very simple happiness that was being generated from just from the meditation. And so it's interesting in the suttas to notice that all this is a preparatory measure before we go into solitude, right? So the next step after that is what the Buddha calls Kaya Viveka, and that means um, physical solitude. So that's when the Buddha starts to talk about the Satipatthana and say that, you know, one with ardent, mindful, and fully aware, one withdraws and goes to the empty places. So the places of, for example, the forest or the caves or a heap of straw. In those days, there were heaps of straw under trees. I think the Buddha put a little heap of straw there before he sat under the Bodhi tree. So that's my justification for a nice comfy cushion it's important to be comfortable <laughs> so uh, all this was a prerequisite and so by the time you actually went off into solitude the mind was quite calmed of the grosser kind of hindrances that can you know send the mind into obsessive thinking or you know into kind of cycles that are just spinning our experience spinning and constructing you know <coughs> guilt or depression or whatever it is you know thoughts are constructing our reality and that takes us away from the truth. So I think it's really, really important to look at these foundations and work on them, because it also gives you scope to apply that in everyday life. You, know, you don't have to be completely removed from noise, completely removed from people, to start understanding how to incline the mind and how to start stilling the mind and finding that happiness within. You know, And then with that kind of confidence, we're more available, we're more able to notice the silence and not to shy away from that, you know, or not to talk back at that. Because silence, as my teacher Ajahn Brown says, is very shy, you know. And even with silence, sometimes we start to say, oh, look, silence. And as soon as you've spoken to the silence, she runs off. <laughs> She's gone. <laughs> you know, because in a way, you know, there's this philosopher, who is it? Descartes, I think, who says, I think, therefore I am. Yeah? So it's like we identify so much with our thinking. When those thoughts are removed from the mind, it reveals that, well, actually, who are we? You know? And so, of course, this is wonderful for spiritual inquiry, but uh, it can be quite frightening to, to try and understand who we are without our thoughts. There was a really funny thing on the internet that I found the other day. Well, it's, I think it's funny anyway. And it said... Um, <laughs> it said, uh, please pay before existing and it was on a parking lot <laughs> and so somebody had put there I pay therefore I am <laughs> of course it was meant to say please pay before exiting but it was like please pay the parking fee oh. before existing <laughs> in this society that's sometimes the case you know how much money you have defines who you are so but certainly the way we think and you know our ability to work things out defines a lot of who we are and uh, even in the deeper stages of meditation when thought has all but faded you know, there can be this little kind of pre-verbal thing that just sticks its head up and goes, how's it going now? How's it going, you know? I call it the assessor, or the sticky-fingered interferer. Like, it likes to just get in there and sort of, yeah, can't quite just let it go. So the whole path is a process of letting activity fade, yeah? So first refining and, you know, purifying our conduct at the physical and verbal level and then gradually letting that fade. And there's a very beautiful sutta that I did want to just quickly touch on before I actually give you some silence. <laughs> um, called the Dweda Vitaka Sutta. And it's about two kinds of thought. And I'll just do it very quickly because I think one of the things that stands out to me is that um, this shows that the Buddha also had to deal with thinking, at least before his enlightenment, right? So, um, and one of the ways he 
started to discern thinking and to sort of get some kind of hold on it was to divide his thoughts into two categories. So he said, what if I divide my thoughts and put on the one side thoughts of desire, say sensual desire, thoughts of negativity, ill will, you know, animosity, and thoughts of harming, <coughs> and on the other side put the opposites. And these opposites are part of the right intention, the second factor of the noble path, which are thoughts of... Um, the first one is renunciation, so this is the opposite of sense desire. And it means just basically letting things go a little bit, you know, not having those compuls compulsions to need that chocolate cake or that extra fix of sugar or whatever it is that, you know, becomes a bit of a vice. So it's like letting go, making peace. And, um, and the second one, which was the opposite of the... Um, aversion was thoughts of um, compassion, thoughts of kindness, so metta basically, and then thoughts of non-harming, so that is the basically compassion, yeah? so you could see those three as the opposites, and he said, you know, those thoughts of, uh, of negativity lead to my affliction, they obstruct wisdom, they lead away from nibbana, they cause difficulties, but on the other hand, those opposite thoughts don't lead to obstruction, they don't lead to difficulties, they don't um, block the way to Nibbana. And then he said, uh, so first of all, the, the challenge was to see that there's a difference, and then to see that, that you have some ability to choose, right? Because it's only when you discern that difference and you're able to say, this one's wholesome, this one's not, that you have an ability to decide, okay, do I really want to be thinking this thought, or is there something I can replace it with, you know? So this was the first step, and then he said, okay, if I think those wholesome thoughts, there's nothing to be feared. Even if I were to think those thoughts for a whole day and night, they wouldn't actually harm me, because there's something called right thought, which is a part of the practice. But then later, he said, to get into the deep meditations, it could cause a difficulty in that it starts to tire my body and mind. And so then he realized that even thinking the good thoughts can basically lead to this kind of leaky bucket thing, you know, where the energy starts to dissipate a little bit. And so he said, what if I bring my mind to singleness, quieten it, still it, and let those thoughts fade? And so then he let those thoughts fade, and then he was able to enter the deeper stages of meditation. So again, it was a gradual, gradual method. It wasn't just that, you know, he sat down and thought, right, I mustn't think anything at all. It was like noticing how the mind's working, how it's relating to thinking, and sometimes you don't have to actually change the thought, you can just relate to the thought with more kindness, yeah? Because it's very important, I mean, today, that's one of the difficulties sometimes of teaching a retreat like this. There can be a tendency to sort of say, I don't want this thinking, you know, I'm, I'm looking for the silence, I, you know, what can I do to get rid of? And that idea of getting rid of carries a certain amount of aversion. And I think more important than the content of, uh, content of our experience is our relationship to it, yeah? So if you find that you're starting to relate, you're starting to sort of develop negativity towards the thinking or the content of the thinking, just try to remember this right intention, this idea of making peace with, of having kindness toward, yeah? Of non-harming, of letting go. And this can be the attitude that you put between you, the knower, and the thought, which is the you know, the object of knowing, if you like, the knower and the known. In that place, you can add the kindness, you can add the letting go, the compassion, not owning. Another way of describing letting go is non-ownership, right? So you don't have to, like, own that thought. Thoughts come, thoughts go. You, know? you don't have to control them, but the idea is not to let them control you, if you like, yeah? So one way of not letting them control you is just to let them be. Know, if you can put in a, a more wholesome thought, great. If you can notice the silence between the thoughts, that's great. You don't need to push that thinking away, you know, because we're trying to learn how our mind's working and how our mind can be used as a tool for happiness or to compound suffering. Yeah? So this is important to know and understand. So, uh, so I think that's enough for the first reflection. And... Um, Perhaps I should just say how roughly I was planning the day to go, but it is quite flexible. So I think it's a small group, and we can probably have a bit of input if we, if we feel we want to. Um, I want to give you some spaces where you can just rest and relax without instruction, or even without having to meditate. You know, you can just lie down after lunch and you know chill out and do nothing, learn what it's like to do nothing. 
Um, but I thought we'd do a guided meditation now, just lightly guided. Um, and then at about 11.30 have lunch and maybe <coughs> have quite a long break until about 1.15. But I would ask straight away that we don't get involved with our phones or even with books. I notice there's a lot of books behind here. But again, that stuff that you're putting into your mind, and it's very rare. I mean, you can read books afterwards, but it's very rare to have space where you just don't have any input and you just let this inner turmoil settle into the silence, into the quiet space. So this can be kind of like a slumber party or a no pillow fight. <coughs> <as well. laughs> Some kind of curling up on blankets party post lunch. If you want to, you can walk outside. There's a patch of uh, grass just behind this building. Um, I was thinking we could go to the beach, but I was told that um, you have to walk through the city centre, and I think that's just not really very quiet. Um, so I, I would recommend that you just stay outside at the back if you want to do that. But, you know, staying within yourself, and please no looking at the phone. Um, and then after that, we'll have a bit more guided med, and we'll have some walking meditation, and, uh, yeah, um, see how things go. There might also be a Q&A session if that's something you feel you would like to do. Um, I'll just ask if anyone has anything, really. Uh, because, yeah, this is a, a, a special opportunity to have some silent space. Yeah? So, since I've spoken for quite a while, please feel free to have a little break, stand up, shake your body, stretch your body, 